Well, hopefully that's paired up more than the right way there. Thank you kindly for everybody for joining us tonight. Um, tonight we're talking about some of the major changes that have come into the legislation with the current government since September 2022. Now, these changes have come about with the change of government, and there's four trenches I'd like to talk about tonight to present to yourselves on these ones. So if I look at what the agenda I'd like to get through tonight... It's going to talk about what have been the reforms that have come into place. Look at what is the roadmap that's come about. This includes the timelines on these reforms and that to go with it. And the last part is, based on these reforms, I'd look at what's going to be the possible award changes or will be the award changes that will come into the Pharmacy Industry Award. I'm anticipating it'll take us about 30 minutes, 35 minutes to get through these changes. There's some phenomenal or significant changes that will impact on the workplace, but there are other changes that they've been brought in is not going to have minimal or very limited impact to most of the people within the community pharmacy. So let's start with the first one to go with it from there. So let's start with it. September 2022, the federal government decided they're going to bring in some changes to the Fair Work Act itself. The Fair Work Act at that particular time hadn't moved a great deal with the previous government. So with the new Labor government taking over, they thought based on their points, they would make some changes into it, what they've been identified from hearing from people. So therefore, the first set of legislation was put forward. There was 296 pages in this legislation. This is the legislation not talking about the memorandum to tell you how it's supposed to be done. That was passed by the federal government in December 2022. Now, in parts with that legislation going through, there were several areas that were going to or have impacted directly straight on to the community pharmacy. Let's talk about the first one. It's to talk about stronger rights for requesting flexible working arrangements, especially under Section 65 of the Fair Work Act itself. Now, these stronger requirements were putting obligations on the employers themselves to really carefully consider the request for flexible working arrangements. Um, currently, they've always been there for a little while now, and it's a part of the award process. But however, this time, they were making it a little bit more stringent on what you could refuse a fle flexible working arrangement request from. And you actually had to enter into a consultation and working with the person if they put forward one to see if you could come to an agreement between both parties on which would be the best activity or the best way of implementing into the workplace. The second part to this one that affected us was the removal of what was called secrecy clauses from employment contracts. That's where we're talking about having an employment contract that may have made it um, illegal or was penalised because the person was not to discuss their wages with other people in the workplace. Now, the changes were to remove that from the employment contracts to make them null and void. However, it's not open slather on those type of aspects now. It does mean that an employee could ask another employee what they're getting paid, but that employee's got no obligations to tell them what they're getting paid. So it works both ways. But as normal, our employees do talk to each other about what is their wages and what's going on from there. Second part was, this is the one that's going to really and has started impact on us from community pharmacy, is what they've classed as the gender pay equity expert panels. They stood up three expert panels predominantly. They were to do with pay equity within the care industry, um, within the social and community sector industry and generically overall. Um, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail as we get on in that, but do note what they're talking about under these expert panels is looking at whether the wages within a particular employment classification or industry and occupation has been suppressed or hasn't been increased as much as other industries' occupations which are dominated by other sex. I'll use an, a straightforward analogy or a simple one that a lot of people um, relate to is where you talk about people working in the community sector. That's no different to community pharmacy at the moment and everybody else. It is a highly feminized industry. 
No, nothing wrong with that either. However, based on some of the evidence and parts that are going on, it's been identified that those industries that are highly feminized appear to have had their wages suppressed, and I'll use it in those parts, wages suppressed, in comparison to other highly dominated male industries. Example, building construction, manufacturing. So this expert panels are looking at all that, and we'll talk about that as we go on. Um, there's been increases in the do with sexual harassment. One that will impact community farms and should have impacted you by now is having fixed term employment contracts. With the changes that have been put into place, um, they've limited how many fixed term contracts could apply to an industry. Now, that doesn't apply to the people who are in senior roles like your um, pharmacy managers or the owners on those parts, but it's predominantly to do with the smaller or the lower paid areas where no longer a fixed term contract could go any more than two years and it can't be two more, any more than two consecutive contracts. Now, that's predominantly looking at it all come about from where people working in the education sector or in community farm or in community sectors where their funding was um, determined on government grants coming through. So they looked at changing it and that's come into place. So therefore, for yourselves, if you've got a fixed term contract in the place at the moment, have a look how long it's been in place. If it's been longer than two years, that person's been on a fixed term contract or they're on the second term, with effect at the end of that period, they will move straight on to permanent employment. And the last one on this particular area we're talking about is secure jobs, better pay part, is changes to enterprise bargaining. Now, it wasn't a highly impacted area in community pharmacy. However, in New South Wales, it did highly impact on a group of people who were still under enterprise agreements that have been put into place for quite a few years. And with the changes to this legislation, it meant those enterprise agreements either had to be terminated underneath the Foreign Fair Work Commission, or they were going to have to be renegotiating for a new one from there. So that was the set, first set of legislation, which is trench one. Um, it went through in December, and it's got still some dates running it on at the moment. Then in the middle of 2023, they decided they still needed to do some more changes. So they introduced what was called protecting the workers bill to go with it from there. Now, this one, is a simple part to go with it. There was only three major changes to it, and they were not changes that from an employer's point of view, you could argue dramatically against because they would have put you as a, on the front pages of the newspapers or would have caused a significant backlash in branding and reputation. They were talking about the enforcement of superannuation guarantee. That is where the people are paying the right amount of super, on the right figures to go with it. They changed how parent paid parental, or not paid parental leave, but parental leave is accessed or used in the workplace. This is more a technical change on when they can access outside of their single continuous period. It's more along when they've looked back, coming back to work or they've returned to the workplace within the first two years. Um, if you've got a more detailed, give us a call on the workplace relations advisory lines around the state and territories, and we can work you through it, but it's more a technical change. And the last one to this protecting worker entitlements was, it's always been a point of contention that whether temporary migrants were actually covered underneath the Fair Work Act. It's always been a position that we'd said that if they're working in the parts, the Fair Work Act apply to them. However, it never actually been formally recognised within the Fair Work Act itself. And this piece of legislation was introduced and put into place to make it certain. So therefore, it happens. Those were the first two rounds of legislation. So you had the Secure Jobs Better Pay one, and you would remember that too at the same time as when they started, the federal government ran their Job Skills Summit um, and had a heap of people trying to talk about what they're going to achieve. Then the protecting worker entitlement come in the middle of the year. It was a very short one, um, very nice to get through. It was an easy reading one for a change. Now that moves us on to what's taken a lot of people's attention and brought attention about is what was called the Fair Work 
legislation amendment closing loopholes bill 2023. Now this was tabled in September last year and there was 284 pages in the original draft. Um, it was, that was in the legislation changes. There was another 500 pages that went with it explaining those changes and how the impact was going on. During that period of time, the Pharmacy Guild and other employer associations lobbied the crossbenchers, being in the Senate and in the, in the House too, that the omnibus bill, as it was called, was too complex and it was going to cause significant problems to the workplace, especially in people understanding it and what's going on. We did get some traction with the crossbenchers who the federal government needed to pass the legislation. And based on their parts, they decided to argue and they did it up was to split this legislation into two parts. What was called closing the loopholes and then closing the loopholes number two. Now the problem with splitting this bill apart into two things meant actually the numbers of pages of legislation changes increased by 145. As you can see, it went from 284 pages to the next two pieces of trenches legislation going through was close to 450 odd pages. It was a massive change in some of the things that put into place. Now let's talk about both of these. The first one went through on the 14th of December. So remember that dramatically because it's another one right before Christmas time when they put into legislation or pass changes when the the award system that have to be implemented into the workplace and trying to educate people on what the changes and their obligations were. Now, the 14th of December one, I'll talk about that in a sec. There's some, they weren't controversial changes, but they would have impact on all business places to think about it. But the second one being closing the loopholes number two was the one that's going to have or has had significant impact on the workplaces. And we're going to talk about those in a sec. So let's cover off on the first one. Right, yeah. What I've done is tried to make this easier to put through and I've put together a slide with, so it's been used around the country with some of the several people and other employer associations about what are the major headaches or the major topics that were put into place with this legislation change and what would be their impact on businesses to go with it. Some businesses, this is going to be a this is significant impact. For community pharmacy, it's not too bad. No, it shouldn't be like that. It is making it more complex and more onerous for an employer, but it could have been a lot worse. Um, it's there. We've got to we've got to live with it. And we've got to put it in place and run our risk mitigation strategies as best as we can to remove any issues to ourselves. So let's have a look at it. The first one that really got people going was same job, same pay. Um, I've got quite a few comments asking or being brought forward to myself is, oh, does that mean our pharmacies are going to get paid the same as what doctors do with getting vaccinations? Um, I had to make the explanation to it. No, it's not applying to that. What it's actually applying to is labour hire. And it's talking about where a labour hire organisation is hiring people into an enterprise or to an organisation that already has an enterprise agreement in place and whatever wages they're paying to the labour hire has to equal or be better than what's been paid in the workplace. It's technical and it really won't apply to us at all because it's talking about labour hire. When we're talking about labour hire, we're talking about the work packs, we're talking about um, Hayes and those type of organisations who put it into the major groups and it's predominantly where the mining sector and those major organisations. Not too bad on that one. If we go straight down on the left hand side, the next one after that, which has got very limited impact to us, is where they're talking about where businesses went into administration. And during that administration per process, they've actually downsized from a large or medium sized business to a small business. What was happening was once they went under the 15 headcount threshold, there was a pervert that redundancy payments weren't made to the provisions or to the employees who remained with it to work through the administration process. They put into place where 
if they were went into administration and they were more than 15 headcount and redundancy applied to it, it applied to them once it went under 15 headcount, except for if there was a time period of six months, if they'd been working in that lower end of the scale, then they would have been classed as a small business. One on the last one on the left-hand side is two parts under the Work Health and Safety Act. Underneath the Work Health and Safety Act for Commonwealth now, they've done two parts. They've increased the threshold on penalties. And the other one is that they've introduced is industrial manslaughter. This was introduced um, to hold accountable those people being directors or CEOs of companies um, to be accountable where in the most unfortunate circumstances, serious injury or death had occurred on the workplace. Uh, previously, it was only really looking at the low level on the PCBU, being the person control of the business unit at that bottom area. Now, this time with this introduction of industrial manslaughter, they're looking at what has been the reasonable practice all the way up the chain to the top position um, and if it's been put into place from there. I don't see it applying to our workplaces a great deal because we've got a highly regulated industry, so we monitor it, but it is an obligation for employers to really monitor and make sure their work health and safety is in place too at the same times. The second part is they gave more rights and protections to union delegates. Um, that was anticipated and it's been brought into place. Now, we'll work our way through it as we go. They've increased discrimination protection for those people who have been, who are experiencing or are exposed to family and domestic violence, especially the people on the receding end of it. Um, it's become more protection that you as an employer who have, may find out that one of your staff have experienced family and domestic violence, uh, not to take any action against them in any form or fashion. And then you're supposed to actually help them try to get help themselves to where they're going. It's more protection for both parties to ensure you do right. Comcare, that was a simple one pushing through, nothing to do with us. That was more to do with emergency workers that weren't actually covered underneath the legislation at the moment. Now let's talk about one that is going to directly impact on community pharmacy and on employers themselves overall. Criminal liability for wage theft. This is something that was introduced and from an employer association point of view, we could not argue dramatically against it, where an organization's employers had actually engaged in systematic, deliberate or intentional removal of wages that were to be paid to the employees. Um, one of the analogies you look at here and it ran through a lot of the media is the 7-Eleven type of arrangements where they were paid and then walked down to the ATM and got withdrawn money and the money is repaid to the employer. It's a position that we couldn't argue, and as I said very clearly, that we probably will never defend or won't even defend anybody from an employer's point of view that is engaged in that behaviour. That is criminal. So it is on systematic, deliberate and intentional. Our colleagues on the from the union side were pushing it for criminal liability for all um, mistakes or incorrect input of wages to an employee, but they saw all sense about that and only made it at the top end. It doesn't change the part that penalties have increased for where you had made you had made made a genuine mistake to go with it. Um, the next one after that is they've in, they've allowed the rights or made it a little bit more easier for union delegates to enter the workplace to look at work health and safety purposes. Currently a union delegate has got the right to enter a workplace if they believe there is a work health and safety breach happening on the work site. Um, we won't see it a great deal in community pharmacy, but the building and instruction sector, it's, it's a regular occurrence on that particular point. And then the last one on this one to do with closing loopholes, is what's classed as protection order ballots, BABs. Protection action, order, sorry, protection action ballots is where employees undertake a vote to indicate what type of protected industrial action they will take in the process of negotiating or bargaining for an enterprise agreement. 
we will, sorry, at the moment, community pharmacy would be very limited to be exposed to that. However, that may change dramatically, especially with the changes to the 2022 legislation enterprise agreements on what it happens in that aspect of where they're talking about the single interest stream of enterprise agreements or multi-business enterprise agreements to go with it from there. So it might occur, it might not, um, but we'll have to wait and see what happens for the next round from there. Right, that was closing the loopholes. There were, as you can see, there were some technical ones in there and very limited impact on what's going to happen in community pharmacy. The biggest ones for ourselves is the discrimination protection for family and domestic violence and the criminal wage thefts. We have to be very careful and conscious of what's going on from there. So let's take us to the one that really got the controversial going on what people were and what's happening from there. Now, this was the one that, as we said, was passed and split across in December. It was actually finally passed in February this year. Now, the slide, my presentation, the slides after this one is where we got the timelines to go with it. There are ma eight major things. Let's have a look at which ones are going to affect us dramatically, or cover off the ones that are not going to affect us dramatically first, then talk about the ones that will from there. So, first one to look at is if we look on the top line, third one along, the digital platform walkers and road transport contractors. There's been changes to recognise what is people would understand as the gig economy, your Uber drivers and those type of people. They're actually going to have um, rules and parts in the place now, and they will see what happens from there. There'll be limited impact onto us because we don't use them, but do note there is a possibility that it may affect what if you use a delivery driver to drop medicines off to places, there might be changes occurring to them on what is their entitlements and what can be paid for them from there. And that takes us through to intractable bargaining workplace determinations. Intractable bargaining is where you've entered into bargaining with your employees for an enterprise agreement to cover your workplace. You've got to a stage in the bargaining process where you've been hidden in pass and neither party can agree to what is the next steps or what you can come to agreement on the terms and conditions within it. If you're looking at that, you can actually, usually won't be too much from the employer side. There's not many happening at the moment, but you can head to the Fair Work Commission and ask for an intractable workplace determination. I'll have to note very clearly on this one here, when you go to apply for intractable bargaining determination, the Fair Work Commission cannot agree to terms and conditions by one party that is less than what's in the current arrangement. So be very conscious if you ever go down this path that if you believe you've hit an impasse and you want to go to the Commission and your, low, your after are a lower thing than the, what's currently within your enterprise agreement, the Fair Work Commission legally cannot grant the lower thing. They have to grant what is in the current enterprise agreement from there. Right, next one after that is we're going to talk about new remedies for contracts that again unfair, unfair terms. Now, this here is an interesting one. It's talking about what is in a contractor's um, arrangements and whether they are contractors or not. We'll see what happens from there. Right here, let's talk about the ones that will directly impact us in the community pharmacy game. First one, definition of a casual employment. With the changes to the legislation, they've actually introduced a term or a new definition for a casual employee. It's interesting, and I'll just read it out how it talks about, a person will be a casual employee if their employment relationship is characterised by an absence of a firm, advanced commitment to ongoing work and if the person is entitled to casual loading under their contract or the fair work instrument. So let's talk on the part. This means you can still have casuals, no problems at all. But if you indicate to the person when you go to put them on that there is a, going to be an ongoing relationship with you, 
that is not a part that gives law eyes to what is a casual one, unless the person is doing a fill for a maternity leave absence or for an annual leave absence or a long service leave absence, where there is a set period of time that you need somebody filled in for. Yes, there would be no issues with that. Now that's part, you've got to think about it, is the commitment to whether it is ongoing work. Now, the other good part, I shouldn't say that, I should say the other part that's made it easier for employers now is previously where you had to offer casual conversion arrangements under the award on a period of time, you no longer have to from an employer's point of view. Now it is up to the employee to come forward and ask. You can still refuse it as long as you're comfortable with that. It is a casual arrangement. There's no commitment to ongoing work and you're unsure what's going to happen with the positions from a business operations. So be very conscious on how it is. You can still employ somebody as a casual, no problems at all, but make sure they are a casual. And if there's no commitment to ongoing permanency from there, if you have made a mistake in this calculations and you believe the person should have been, no problems, transfer them across to being a permanent person. But do remember the this individual, if you say no to them, can head off to the Fair Work Commission to ask for a determination on this. And you'll have to justify to the commission on why that role is a casual one and it's based on the employment arrangements and what's happening from there. They have retained one of the provisions within the Act itself that permits you to, I should, uh, permits you to set off what's already been paid to the casual employee against if they should have been on a permanency arrangement. We'll wait and see how that plays out in life. There's going to be decisions about that one. The other one is they've increased civil penalties. Please note on this one now, the civil penalties have increased by up to fivefold. So you're talking a phenomenal amount or a phenomenal amount of wages being put onto them from there. So if I use an example, you're talking about some of the larger bills now will be up to 400, 470,000 for ordinary um, breaches and up to 4 million for a serious breach. So you've got to be very careful and conscious to meet your compliance requirements and put them into place from there. There is one on here is if you've ever been given a compliance notice from the Fair Work Ombudsman's Office, um, and I, if you do ever get that, please ensure you ring the Duet Place Relation Advisors to talk about it and what it means for you. If you don't apply with them, they've actually increased the threshold, double the threshold for non-compliance with their compliance notice for the FWA. So please be conscious on those ones. That takes us to the last one on this particular screen that I'm covering off here at the moment. It's ran through the media. People have been hearing about is this new what is classed as the right to disconnect. Now, the right to disconnect caught all of us by surprise. It was actually put in place and tabled with the federal government by the Greens to get their vote in the legislation. Now, this right to disconnect is talking about where a person can reasonably refuse to engage with their employer or a third party in after hours activities or work or being contacted by the employer or a third party after their normal working hours. Now, there are not ways around it, but there are other expectations on this right to disconnect. Now, if you're only ringing up the person to say, what do you do with this? There is, that's, is it a reasonable approach to ring them during that period of time or contact them? However, it still relies on what the person's position is what they're actually being paid. Is there an expectation that they be on call to answer phone calls? Um, are they a part of a necessary thing to address? Um, for example, defense, security, and those ones have been excluded from these provisions. But I'll use the part is if you've got a senior manager role or an executive officer role going in there, there would be an expectation that they should be available on a reasonable basis to answer phone calls from other parts of those senior groups. But at the same time, need to ensure your employment contracts have those type of 
words in there or your policies that certain positions are expected. And if they are expected, have they been remunerated sufficiently to cover them to be on call and be accessible in those out of office hour works? They were the eight major ones as we're talking about as we've looked through from here. Now, these particular ones are the ones that are going to cause impact, especially the casual ones, especially the determination of employment status on what it means from there, the right disconnect, increase the penalty rates in those. Um, there are a couple of other changes to rights of entry and which will have parts, which is union delegates rights or delegates rights in the workplace. But we're still working through those particular points now with the Fair Work Commission on actually what is the the intent behind it and actually the wording and how it's going to apply to be in the workplace from there. So if I look at the next slide, so we'll jump across, that's those ones. Now let's have a look at what the timeline looks like. Now this is where it was scary. Um, until we actually put this timeline into place, you didn't realise how much conflict and how much was happening at one time. So. So we thought the easiest way to do this would be to run it from 2022 right through to 2025. Now, I do note to everybody on the wage theft position, as I look at the bottom left-hand side of my screen and everything else in the position there, it's got the wage theft January 2025. Now, that January 2025 is for all businesses that are, what would you say, are greater than 15 headcount. However, with effect, if you're a small business, less than 15 headcount, you've got an extra 12 months before those ones come in. It doesn't mean you're going to, it's a get out of jail free card for doing something. What it just means is the intentional, deliberate and systematic as a criminal offence will not apply to a small business less than 15 headcount until January 2026. Um, does it mean you're not going to remove any obligations to ensure that your wages are correct? No, those penalties are there at the moment and they will apply. So it is up to everybody as an employer to ensure you're, you are compliant with your parts. So if you look at the timelines, 2023 has got quite a few things going in there. A lot of them passed already and a lot have been put into place to go with it. The 2024s are on the way coming through now. As you note in 2024, Superannuation now has been included into the NES. So it is a provision that happens from there. Um, the sham contractor civil penalties are coming down. You look at the July aspect of what's coming in. You've got the minimum wage, parental leave increasing, as you note, the paid parental leave that's been provided by the federal government as an allowance is increasing by two weeks per year until it reaches 20, 26, 26 weeks in 2026. Um, we've got variations to the awards and EAs coming, delegates right and right of entries. We're looking at the August platform. We've got the casual definition coming in, the employment one coming on there. The right to disconnect is where it first kicks in. We're arguing pretty strongly that there should be an extension for the small businesses. They're leaning down that one, but I'm not going to hold my breath on it because we never know. Um, the labour hire is in there, and then we've got the wage theft. I threw in the middle of the whole chart was other ones that are coming down the path and what we're looking at from there. Um, especially that's going to impact on the pharmacy industry award and what could affect yourselves as employers to go with it from there. So that's just a flow chart that I put together to show how it's all leaning together. Now, we have been talking with the minister about whether more is coming down. He gave us a undertaking that, no, he's not expecting to introduce any more legislation changes. However, if the caveat went in there, if it all comes together and he's got the right approach, he may bring it forward. We'll have to wait and see what happens from there. So that's taken the timeline. Now let's talk about or put forward to what I'm expecting or what is going to expect that's going to happen with the awards. Let's talk about proposed changes that are coming down on the parts um, 
what's going to happen and everything else. So the first one, pay equity. Um, it has been come very clear and then the Fair Work Commission has put it through to us at the moment that it has been identified that pharmacy assistants who are in the industry at the moment have been identified as a highly feminized industry and met their benchmarks. Um, and based on that research they put together, have got the appearance that their wages within the pharmacy industry award have not been benchmarked or work valued correctly compared to other occupations or industries across Australia. When they did the research and everything else, they identified 29 um, initial ones. That's come down to 13 occupations and the pharmacy industry award with the pharmacy assistant is that one. Currently, at the moment, we've just received stage two's research coming back from the Fair Work Commission, um, making it clear again that we'll have, there will be a pay equity case run on the pharmacy assistance. Uh, when that is to occur, based on the words from the Fair Work Commission, it will occur this year. So it means within the next six months, there will be a pay equity case undertaken within the Fair Work Commission on pharmacy assistance. The pharmacists were done previously. However, as we get into the next one, we talk about wages, I'll cover off and part with them. So I will be coming out seeking support and help from members in this particular area to work out what would be a good comparison, how they are employed, what they're working from there. So do expect some phone calls and in engagement from us on that particular topic. Right here, the next change that we're not gonna miss out, wages within the Farms Industry Award. They are in the process of doing the annual minimum wage review at the moment. Um, it's a going through, the first rounds have went in, the first submissions are in this month. Next lot of submissions are in next month in May. Um, the Fair Work Commission's indicated to us they hope to have a decision by the end of May going into June um, after the budget for the federal budget's been released. Now, please for noting on these top of ones. Underneath the aged care work value case that's been running, which includes nurses and other care mayor, they have indicated people with a four yearly degree, especially in the nurses within the aged care industry will be entitled to a wage increase to the minimum safety net underneath the award itself at 28.5%. There are discussions on how is that to be implemented. It normally won't be implemented in one trench. It'll be implemented in two, three or four trenches, depends on the arguments we put forward. Now, if we do a straightforward comparison, we can see that our pharmacists are a minimum four yearly degree qualified people. So therefore, just on that analogy, that's the base rate within the minimum safety net. That's a possibility that should be paid to the pharmacy assistance under the PIA going forward into, or pharmacist going forward into the future. There is no confirmation on that particular point yet, but we do expect it to happen. At the same time, it is noted that the aged care cert three level people and below were given a 15% wage increase to the minimum safety net. Now, the minute this increased it up dramatically above where the cert three qualification was, which is a different level within the parts. But if you benchmark that type of thing against what is the pharmacy industry award, that's our level three pharmacy assistance. They've been put up already. And they're, in, they're happening at the moment. They're still looking at the next levels after that, but it's anticipated they'll probably run from 15 to 25% wage increase for what's above a Cert three qualification within that industry. And we are very comparative to that industry underneath the pharmacy. The second part is do remember last year's minimum wage review gave 5.75% to the minimum safety net being the award itself. Um, that increased it dramatically. Now, 
The employer associations have filed submissions with the Fair Work Commission asking for a maximum increase of anything from 2% up to 2.8%, depends on which application you read. Um, the unions have filed their submissions. Um, it's a lot lower than we we're expecting it. They filed it at 5% wage increase in the minimum safety net. The federal government's filed theirs and said that workers should not be going backwards against what's happening out there. Everybody's probably seen what CPI is and what's happening there. It's running at above four to five percent. So it is anticipated, and I'll say the word anticipated, that we would be looking at a increase to the minimum safety net of the minimum wages of somewhere between three and four percent at the minimum. That doesn't include the increases to the work value ones from the aged care industry, the nurses side of it, and the social community sector, which does affect healthcare too at the same time. That increase in the minimum wage review is on top of those other increases to the work value side. Uh, it's always good news from myself on those parts, right? Yeah. The right to disconnect is coming in. Um, currently working with the Fair Work Commission on what the language is and the words are. We've got our next hearing next week on that particular topic on what is the words to go in there for the um, delegates' rights. The right to disconnect starts next week and goes in through May to have in place. The biggest one here is they have to be in place by July and August 2024 in the awards. But as you know, I put it up there as 12 months later for small business on the right to disconnect. So we small business less than 15 headcount have got an extra 12 months. Superannuation is the other part that's coming in. Please note, we have got the 0.5 increase coming to the wages, so that will increase it. At the same time, the language within the fair, in the pharmacy industry award has changed, but it hasn't changed the intent or the concept from there. There's just new language being used. Right, that's quite a bit. Let's talk about, let's do a cover up very quickly on what is coming down the track that's on top of all this. What we have is the award review. Now that's been a part, that was put in place in 2022 with the legislation changes going through that to obtain Senator Pocock's vote on the floor, they had to agree to that the awards would be reviewed. That's got to occur by the end of this year. Um, and we're in the process of working through it. There's another case that's ongoing at the moment is increased to job security. It's a very strong word and it's been used by the unions dramatically that they do not like casual employment. They would prefer everybody to be on a permanent arrangement. So they're looking at how to make that more solid and remove what is classed as casual work. Same as flexibility. There's a couple of cases running in the Fair Work Commission at the moment, we're a party to them, is the concept of work from home. Um, now my colleagues from the union side are running an argument that every employee should have the right to work from home. Um, they miss the parties. There is a group of employees out there and businesses and organisations, industries, that you actually have to see and talk to the customer in a location and face-to-face. Um, we've tried to put that across to them, but we've got to see what happens from there and it hasn't grown. As you can see there, that's quite a few things that are coming down the path. Um, they're going to be a lot of impact. I'm going to probably come out or I will be coming out to members asking for their assistance or help in addressing and meeting some of these problems and questions. Now, I do know a couple of questions have come into the part what I'm going to do is we'll be taking note of those questions and actually directly replying to you from there. And the same as if you have got any additional questions, what we do have, and I'll bring it up on the last slide, is we do have the national WR at guild.org.au address. If you do have any questions or points, please drop it onto those and we'll get back to you and answer them as best we can. Um, I'm going to try to run, and I will run another couple of sessions as we go, once I get some more guidance and once we work out exactly what's happening on the language to do with the delegates' rights, on the right to disconnect, 
and other parts on especially the pay equity sides that are coming into the award and the impact. They'll either be done as a information session or we may run into a QA, and a but I'll see how we get around from them. So from there, um, I'm saying, I do note on the last part here is, please understand the 25% casual loading is not going to be removed for a casual point. But if you do put them across to permanency, and that's a question a lot of people ask, the casual loading is not required to be paid. That's your decision if you wish to continue paying the 25% loading for casual, but it's not obliged to from there. You've just got to pay at least equal to or better than what is the minimum safety net being the award rates for that employment classification. So I'll cover up on that last part. If you do have any other questions, I will answer these questions, put them out to people from there who's registered in that or just on the website. This presentation will be up on the Guild website and be accessible for every member on the employer and from employers to have a look at it. And we'll keep doing more of them as we go through. Just a note, last one, I'm actually presenting on Wednesday night with Ravens to talk about the remuneration, the findings we've had on what people are being paid out there. Um, and that's occasion on Wednesday night. Uh, from there, I'd like to thank everybody who's attended tonight. I hope it's been informative. But if you do have the questions, put it through to the national wr.guild.org.au email and we'll answer you from there. Thank you very kindly and have a good night.